Hello and welcome to 10 Lessons Learned, where we talk to sages and gurus, leaders and luminaries from all over the world to dispense their wisdom for your career, business and life in order to make this world a little wiser, lesson by lesson. My name is Robert Hossery and I'm your host for this episode. Today's guest is Randy Crane, known as the fearless marketer and is nationally acclaimed sales and marketing expert with over 40 years experience with many global brands and startups. He's passionate about leadership and emotional marketing strategies that deliver real value to customers and impact businesses. Randy is a mentor, a visionary, and a true master of his craft, inspiring others to reach greatness and achieve their dreams. And we're very happy to have him on our show today. Welcome, Randy. Thanks for being here. Robert, thank you so much for having me on the show. Since our previous call, I have been so looking forward to this conversation, my friend. So have I, and I'm glad that we have this opportunity to share this with the world. Absolutely. So, Randy, before we get started, let me ask you what we ask all our guests. With all the experience that you've got, what would you have wanted to tell your younger self to prepare him? You know what? I don't even know where the list begins, but I, I can tell you this much. I think what I would tell my younger self is that things are always as they seem to be, okay? And when I say that, I mean, we're always taught that what happens out there affects what happens in here. That person did me wrong, so it hurt my feelings, or that person stole my money, so it's hurt me. And it's really not that way at all. I would have told my younger self, fix what's in here, baby, and the world will fix itself. And I think I've learned that over the years, that playing the blame game doesn't work at all. As a matter of fact, it's not even satisfying. And it takes a long time to learn that lesson. If we had the opportunity to go back and teach that to ourselves, maybe our lives would be a little smoother. You know what? It's funny too, Robert, because when you and I were kids, there was nobody to teach that to us. Mm. The people that did know didn't talk about it and everybody else just didn't know any better. And uh, add to that fact, as young people, we're invincible. We know everything. Oh, and I will tell you, and I say this all the time. When I was 20, I was the smartest guy in the world. Yep. I knew it all. Yep. And nobody could tell me anything. Hence the, the reason that we all started 10 Lessons Learned, because you're right. Nobody talks about this. Nobody shares I, this wisdom, this information with the next generation. All, as, as I pointed out in the recent episode, Nobody reminds the older generation that they need to remember this stuff. No, you're so right. And you see, this is where it becomes difficult. When we were young, it was all about you do this and this will happen. Go out and take on the world. You can be anything. You can have anything you want. And over the years, I found that you can't have what you want. You can only have what you are. And we can talk about that maybe after. Let's do that because that is really interesting. I do well, like that. I learned something in that marketing is and selling is not a rudimentary thing. It's a connection thing. It's not something where I say this and you'll say that. I'll say this and then you say that and then you close the sale. Life doesn't work that way. Marketing is an internal thing. It's not something that you can say, hey, well, I'm going to write some copy and people are going to buy my product. I can read ad copy and I can tell whether it's authentic or not. And, and it may not be how it's written. It may, it might be written very well, but there's just something, and I don't know what, but there's just something that strikes me wrong. And I'm sure every person, including yourself, Robert, has had a situation like that in your life. I don't know what it yeah. is. It's just, you might've just said a tail end of a word. It, it just didn't resonate with me. And you see, marketing is not something that you just do. It's not even something that you just learn. It, it's an emotional connection between you and the people that you're talking to, whether you're talking yeah. to them through copy or through verbal or through video or whatever it is you're doing. It's an internal feel. And if you don't feel that person's problem, if you don't feel that person's resolution or that person's difficulty in life, then it's very difficult for me to assimilate words that can correct that problem in a well, way that you're going to feel comfortable. That sort of segues directly into your first lesson. So let, let's talk about lesson number one. 
Human beings make decisions based on emotions, not on facts. Look, Randy, I, I've been in sales and marketing for about 40 years. I agree with that comment, but I'd like to, I'd like to hear more. So tell us about that. Human beings make decisions based on emotion. And, and let me just get, I've got an example here, if you don't mind me telling a quick Please. story. So what ends up happening is I'm 18 years old and I really want this set of speakers. And I had this Harman Kardon stereo system, but they came with really lousy speakers. So I had these ones I had my eye on, big tall ones, the liquid cooled. I'm sure you remember those, right? They were massive. And they wanted $500 for them. And in 1978, 500 bucks was a lot of money. So I saved and I saved for months. Finally had the money to buy. I went to the bank, got my money out of the bank, went to the audio store, bought my speakers, gave the guy the money, put them in my car and brought them home. Plugged them into my stereo system. Robert, wow, what a sound. It was awesome. And I was so excited. So I sat down at my kitchen table. I'm sitting there and the receipt was on the table. So I skipped up the receipt, looked at the receipt. All of a sudden, I just got this feeling. I said, oh my God, I got a girlfriend. I got rent to pay. I'm not going to get paid for two more weeks. Oh my God, what am I going to do? I've got no money. Can I tell you something that happened? Those speakers magically disconnected from the stereo, went back into the box, magically moved into my car, and within about 40 minutes, we're back at the store. Human beings make emotional decisions, and then they support it with reason and rationality after the fact. Emotion always comes first. Somebody asked me, I was doing a live event yesterday, and somebody said to me, they said, can you train yourself to put your, your rational mind first? And I said, you can train yourself to do anything. You can train yourself to bark like a dog, but you're not wired that way. We're wired to allow our emotions to be the contributing factor to who and what we are. We're emotional creatures and we connect with people on an emotional scale. So yeah, emotions always come first. Lesson number two, a lot of times what we are taught is not the absolute truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. And don't get me wrong. Truth is, it's contextual. Okay. It is contextual. I mean, you tell me a lie, but if I believe it, it's obviously the truth to me. And you see, there's, and don't get me wrong, because every human being in the world creates its own reality. What we think and what we feel creates reality. Your reality, not mine. And every human being has that capability. It's just that I think everybody ultimately knows that, but they know it from a distance. You know how you know things certain that are close to you. It's there, but you don't think about it. In, in lesson number two, you're saying that well, a lot of what we are taught is not the truth. That's and right. I will agree with that. You've touched on your next lesson there, which yeah. is basically the idea that the outside world creates reality. It's a fallacy. The, the two are entwined. So entwined. lesson two and, and three are. are entwined. Yes, and they are. Quick story, I... My son, Brandon, when he was a little boy, he was in grade one. And I had taught him, uh, before he went to school, I taught him how to collimate the numbers to add. He added the zero columns. And, right. So he goes to school, does a test. He was done about 10 minutes before all the other kids. And they gave him an F. So he came home to me crying because he couldn't understand why he failed. So I went to the school and they told me that the reason he failed is because we don't want him to do that. We want him to add this and this, carry over this and this. I thought that was a little strange. That's fine. We move along from there. And he, we're reading. And you and I were taught to read the same way. And years later, this moves along now to about 1993, 94. I run, into, I, I run across this ad for a guy named Howard Burke, fastest speed reader in the world. Could read something like 20 pages a minute. He says... Pay me $99, and if you haven't improved your speed in two weeks, I'll give you your money back. I figured, okay, here we go. I could probably read three quarters of a page a minute at the time, which I think is standard for most people. After taking his course for a couple of weeks, I was reading about two pages a minute. But it's interesting because I wasn't reading the this ad, but something. I wasn't reading those words anymore. 
And I found that when I could read two words a minute, my comprehension went way up. And I didn't kind of put two and two together until years later. And what I ended up finding was that what they teach you in school is they don't necessarily want you to be educated. Once again, this is why it's important to expand your mind and listen to different points of view. So oh, you can sure. have that conversation. So you can have that internal enlightenment. Yes, I, I will take anything that is said to me at face value, because one of my values is I'll believe anything that is said to me until it's proven incorrect, until I can go and see or find credible sources to disprove that. But I don't stop researching it just because Randy said this is the way it oh, is and God. I like Randy and I believe what Randy says. I have had many discussions, including with some of my co-hosts on this show, about many topics that they strongly believe in, I strongly believe in. But it's the fact that we all respect each other enough to listen to our points of view and continue to learn. So what you're saying as far as what we are taught is not strictly speaking the truth. I'll, I agree and I will challenge it in this sense. It is the truth according, as you just said, to someone else. It's a, it's a slanted view. When I say slanted, not meaning wrong, it's just another perception. Exactly. Okay. And don't get me wrong. The, the pitch that I'm giving you is my perception. It doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just a it, perception. But it makes it valuable because now I have, now I have Randy Crane's point of view as well as mine, as well as Aristotle, as well as all these other points of view in my head. And I can weigh all of this up. So it is important. And it and is. Like, the perception, uh, the, the point of being a perception mm -hmm. is the fact that it now gives you something to think about. Yes, absolutely. It gives you something to think about. And you know what? Maybe Randy's right. Maybe he's wrong. Exactly. And that's okay, too. The second part of all that lesson number three, which is basically, if I can paraphrase your lesson, which is, in my words, perception is reality. Your perception is your reality. So that's what you're saying with the idea that the outside world creates reality is a fallacy. I agree with. But a lot of people don't understand that. They don't understand what you just said. It's a slanted view. A particular point of view is a point of view from a perspective of someone else. Oh, absolutely. And you see, we are a creation of our own environment. It was interesting. And I don't know whether I told you this before, but I was actually going to be a priest. And I went and took a degree in theology and I went to a seminary, spent several years in seminary. And then I was away, just about six weeks away from taking my vows as a priest. And they do an interview with you. So I guess I figured at the time that while they're interviewing me, I'll be interviewing them. And needless to say, that did not work out as well as I'd kind of hoped. So I would start asking them questions like, what do you think the political time was like during the time of Jesus? They don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's not important here. And I said, okay, because I'm searching for the truth. Well, let's talk about the financial times during that period. I mean, come on, the guy's walking around in moccasins. He's got no money. How is he getting around? How is he doing? No, we don't want to talk about any of that. This kind of went on for a little while. And my, my bishop turned around. He said to me, he said, Randy, maybe you need to take a little time off to make a consideration of your vocation. And I said, okay, I think that's a good idea. So that was 43 years ago, and uh, I'm still reconsidering. Okay. But the interesting part about that, when I left the church, I continued my studies. But instead of now reading catechism, I'm now reading the Vedics. I'm reading the Hindu. I'm reading the Muslims. I'm reading the, the Buddhists, the, the I Ching. I'm reading all of that information digest. And I needed to make money at the time. So I became a marketer and, and uh, found out I was pretty good at that. And I started studying that stuff. And I found that over the years, the two kind of became one for me. And that's when I started to realize that human beings are emotional creatures. And it's their perception of the world that creates who they are. So what you think causes what you feel inside. Your brain releases chemicals into your body to make you feel exactly how you think. 
And when you start feeling how you think, it causes more thoughts to be created, which causes more chemicals to flow. And this just keeps going on and on. Now, if it's a good thing, if it's happy, then those thoughts and those feelings are fantastic. Okay, it's euphoric. But if you're sad, the same rules apply. And you spiral. And you do. And you know what? It's hard to pull yourself out. One of the things I said, I was doing a live talk yesterday, and one of the things that I, I talked about was feelings. Feelings are the end of the line. Uh, when you are in love, you can't shut off being in love. You're in it. There is no exit door. When you've gone to a scary movie and your body is shaking, there is no exit door. You can't get out. Those emotional triggers that you have that, or that someone presents to you causes you, those emotional triggers cause you to put you into that locked door. That and mental once state. You're there, once you're in, in homeostasis, in that feeling, you don't get out. It's a little prison for at least a certain period of time. And this is where self-awareness comes into it. If you're aware that you're in that little prison, then you ah. just pull the key out of your pocket and open that door. We see this all the time. People that are in depression. The reason people are depressed, and there's a difference between being depressed and being in depression. Depressed is an instance. Depression is a lifestyle. But if I'm depressed today, and I'm depressed tomorrow, and I'm depressed the day after, and the day after, and the day after, what am I doing? You're creating, creating those that. chemicals that will build that cell that you're going to put yourself in. It, absolutely. And what's going to happen is the chemicals are going to go into my body, and the body is going to become the unconscious mind. Now, and, I, I just, I'll, I'll stop you there because I just want to make sure our audience understands. We're not belittling this. We're just stating mm -hmm. the fact. It is Absolutely. serious. You, this is a serious condition. And, and if you are in that state, seek help. Talk to someone else. Understanding what Randy's saying, this is how this will perpetuate. That's the real problem. It perpetuates because we just keep going further and further down that hole. And we don't feel that we have anybody. But that's you know right. what? You're not alone. And that's the reality of it. You know what? Uh, we've all been at a place in our lives where depression has been a uh, combat. I know I have. Me and, too. Uh, you know what? It, it's just, it's hard. It's really hard. But I think once you have a clear understanding of, of what it is, and then you have a way of finding a way to change that for yourself, because creating a habit of one thing, Changing that habit is just a question of changing your mind, okay? And just doing it over and over. I just keep doing it. You mentioned spirituality, which leads yes. us into your next lesson, yes. which is we are all spiritual beings having a human experience. That's lesson number four. I think that's great. Being a, a student of philosophy, I agree with you. It's funny. This may seem a little silly, but... If we were all just spiritual beings, what does coffee taste like? What does fresh grass smell like? You'd never know because you need that body in order to, to experience it. I think quantum physics in this day and age has really kind of proven that but your heart acts as a transmitter, your brain acts as a receiver, and like attracts like. So whenever you give out into the world, you get back. Like I said, if you do dirt by people, you know what? It comes around. It's going to come back on you tenfold. And it usually does. And because, like I said, I'm no exception to the rule. I've done it. I've experienced that myself, and I'm sure you have too. Absolutely. And that's why I'm nodding furiously uh, for yeah. our, our um, podcast audience who are not watching us on YouTube. Definitely. Because what goes around comes around. And, karma, you know, karma is real, people. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. And it's so funny, too, because there's repercussions for everything you do. And if like attracts like, when you hurt somebody, that hurts coming back to you. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not going to come back the same way. No. And you're not going to know when it's coming. But you can start banking. Well, but on the same note, it, it's the same thing when you do good, my people. Yes. It's going to come back to you as well. You mentioned this before, and... You studied a lot of different philosophies, a lot of different religions, a lot of different cultures, and so have I. And, and it's just so clear that all of these pretty much preach 
the same thing. They be do. Nice, just be nice to each other. Look. It amazes me that, that we still aren't nice to each other. And it's funny to you because I'm just trying to put this in, in the right wording. When I was young, it was all about the money, the car, the girls, the house, the friends, the camaraderie. It was all about everything external to me. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure it was with you too. And had to have the nice car, had to have nice clothes. 64 years old. And God forbid you and I are in the last quarter of the game. But none of that stuff means anything. True. Because when the day comes that I leave this world, it's all going to belong to somebody else. That's it. I, I saw a thing the other day and they said the photo albums, okay, are going to get passed down to your kids who are going to get passed down to your their kids. And by the time it's passed a couple of times down, they're going to look at that and say, who is that guy? They're not going to know anybody. They're not going to know who those people are. That's right. And I mean, this is a reality check. Oh, it certainly is, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's an absolute reality check. You're going to spend your whole life collecting stuff. What's the point? Stuff. What is the point? If I can spend my life making another human being's life better, now, whether, whether that's family, whether that's part of my job, and it is at the moment, whatever, isn't that more fulfilling for me spiritually and as a human being than collecting stuff? Now, I'm sure there's a lot of people in our audience now that are shaking their heads going, no, we want our stuff. Go for it. We're not saying don't do it. We're just saying we've learned, you know, 10 lessons learned. You know, it's funny. I, when I was younger, I used to wear really good suits and I have really good shoes. And I was saying, I did a live event yesterday and I went in my slippers, my bedroom slippers. And somebody asked me, they said, why do you wear your slippers when you're standing on stage? I said, they're comfortable. Like they're really comfortable. They said, most people wear leather shoes. Okay. Well, your shoes are not comfortable. Okay. They're not comfortable. And I don't wear a suit anymore and I don't put a tie on. Mm -hmm. Honestly, Robert, thank God. Thank God beyond that in my life. Yeah. But Worrying still... about what other people think of you. I think we're past that. Absolutely. The day they created business casual was probably the best day of my life. But you know, the interesting part about this is that authenticity, who you are. And you know what? Me wearing slippers didn't change my message. Okay. I just means I'm a guy who wears slippers. My wife, Lori, and I, we live a very minimalist life. We moved out of a three-bedroom uh, three house into a two-bedroom townhouse, and we got rid of all that stuff because it's not going to, we're not taking it with us anyway. The interesting part about that is that if the assets and the money and the property and the cars are not what's important, then the question comes, what is? Mm. And the answer to that question is, it's the memories. It's the experiences, because I think those are what we're going to take. Without a doubt. And that's what we're going to leave as well. That's what we're going to leave. And Absolutely. it, again, fits into your fifth lesson, which is human beings connect with other human beings on an emotional level. And there's, I think it was uh, Maya Angelou, he said, nobody's going to remember what you said, but they might remember how you made them feel. That's right. And it's the emotional connection that you're talking about. Oh, yeah. That you started this conversation with, and we're back yes, to it in your fifth lesson. So tell us about, about that lesson and, and how you came up with that and what it means to you. Human beings connect with other human beings. And it really came to me when they started working with AI. Because marketers were coming to me, young marketers were coming to me, and they were saying, oh, you know what? I'm just going to have ChatGPT write my copy for me here write my blog for me. And I thought, yeah, write my content for my website. I said, yeah, you go right ahead and do that. But remember something, human beings connect with other human beings and they connect with them on an emotional level. ChatGPT is a machine. I mean, it might be a software or whatever else you want to call it, but it's still a machine. It's not human. And humans connect with other humans, not with machines. Okay. Do I think that will change in years to come? Maybe at a hundred years or maybe a thousand, I don't know. But a machine cannot be human, at least not right now. Agreed. 
don't want a machine to write your code or you want machines to write your copy, your customer is going to know it because they're not going to feel you. And human beings have to feel. This is the reason we read a great book. This is the reason we go to the movies. If I go to a movie to watch a love story, I want to cry. I want to feel that. If I go to watch a sad story, I want to feel sad. But if I go to a horror movie, I want to be scared. Because these are the emotions that drive us as human beings. These are what we do. We connect. With other human beings. With other human beings. Look, Robert, you and I have, we've had a couple of really great conversations in the past. There's a connection between you and I. And it's a chemical connection. I feel you. I feel you as a person. And I'm sure you feel me too. Yes. Now, you're on the other side of the planet. And it just goes to show you how that electromagnetic electricity works because it can work through any amount of time, any amount of space. It's connection. And that's what every human being is looking for is that connection, whether it's in, in the copy we read, the stories we tell, whatever the case is. Couldn't agree more. And again, I come back to this show. I have connected, whether I've interviewed or whether I've just listened as, as part of the audience, to every guest we've had because they're human, because their stories were emotional, and because there was a connection there, something yeah. that resonated with me and something that resonated with our listeners. That's why we have listeners in over nine, over 100 countries now because Beautiful. of this human connection. Human beings sharing their perspective and sharing their wisdom with other human beings for no other purpose than just to share it, just to leave something behind, make the world a little wiser lesson by lesson. So that's... Absolutely. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and I totally agree with you. We're just going to take a quick break. We'd like to thank our affiliate partner, Audible. Audible is an amazing way to consume 10 lessons learned, books, and other podcasts, allowing you to build a library of knowledge all in one place. You can start your free 30-day trial by going to audibletrial.com slash 10 lessons learned. With Audible, you can find your favorite lesson while at home or on the go. Once again, that's audibletrial.com slash one zero lessons learned for a free 30-day trial. The link will be in the show notes. Our guest today is Randy Crane, entrepreneur, marketing guru, and CEO, an all-around good guy. Randy, let's get on to lesson number six. The world we live in is not a result of people who don't know what they're doing. It's by design. Can you explain that to me? I'm finding it a little difficult to, to wrap my head around that one. It's interesting because the world itself has been in the planning stages for centuries, thousands of years. It, it come, most recently, I come back to what I was saying earlier about J.D. Rockefeller and how he wanted to formulate the educational system. He's just one instrument in a series of instruments that have progressed this world along to where we are today. In 1942, Adolf Hitler was using packet switching. Okay, in other words, he was sending emails through the internet. But we didn't hear about the internet until 1991. As a matter of fact, I think we heard about it on Star Trek. But regardless of that, we didn't get it until around 91. The point that I'm making is, is that what they considered the real world is by design. Okay, I think the the COVID scare, I think the processed foods, I think the pharmaceutical industry has played a huge part in it. the food industry. I mean, if this was 100 years ago, there would be no such thing as chicken McNuggets. 30 or 40 years for us to realize that they're not healthy, that they're not a healthy choice. So what I'm saying is that this world has been built out over a period of time, and it's been built in by people and organizations that I think, stand behind the, the screen, okay? They're not in the forefront, of it, but they're mm -hmm. the ones that are controlling what goes on in the world to a great degree. Today, we know of them as the World Economic Forum or the, the United Nations. I mean, they're all kind of in part of this. But here in Canada, I mean, we've got a prime minister that, in my opinion, has done a horrible job. And 
But has he done a horrible job? He's maybe done a horrible job for the people, but maybe he's not working for the people. And again, this is just a question. I'm not saying that's the case. I think that if you live in that world and allow the world to dictate who you are and what you do, then you're at the mercy of the world. And what's the solution? I mean, I, I, I've got many things I'd like to say to this, but I'm sure what, you do. What's the, uh, what's the solution that you that that you can see? If you live in that world, the, as you said, then you're allowing it to dictate. So what's the solution then? You know what? I just recently did a video on, I call it the inside economy. And again, this is just strictly a perception. I, I chose many years ago, back in 1993, to go into my own business and work for my own. In 1993, when I went in to talk to a customer, he'd said to me, where's your office, Randy? And I'd say, I have my office at home. What kind of business could you have running from home? You can't run a business from home. That's where you sleep. And so it made it very hard in 1993 to, to get a business established working from home. Today, it's the norm. In this world that I live in today, I have my inside economy. I pay my bills. If the uh, inflation goes up a little bit, I raise my rates or I take on another client. But I work in the, I work in the confines of my home. And when I say that, what happens out there? What happens out there? I don't care what goes on out there. I do care what goes on in here. And I think more people have to start learning to live that way. I'm more concerned about my happiness and my way of life inside my home than I am what's going on out there. There are many things that you've said that do not resonate with me. Look, let's start with the things that, that I do agree with. I, I believe that we are all part of an ecosystem. It does take a village to raise a child. It does yes. take a community to make social change. And unless we all interact with each other as humans emotionally and connect, then we fall into this trap of pointing fingers. We fall into this trap of not being part of society. The other thing that does resonate with me that you said is, yes, there are forces out there and I call them monopolies. And you know, this is where I will probably be lambasted in the comments, but this is where I believe more government regulation is required. We cannot have monopolies. They are too powerful and they just control everything. everything. And there's no need for that. This is where we need the small entrepreneur. This is where we need the small mom and pop businesses to make us healthier. Look, don't misunderstand me. What I'm saying is that I look at what's happening in my world. I mean, I'm still part of my community. I'm still part of my connection with other people. Okay. Mm. But I know people, they're worried about where their next dollar is coming from. They're worried about how I'm going to pay my bills or how I'm going to. This is what I'm talking about. When I, what happens in here, this is my economy, my personal economy. And Robert, you've got your personal economy. All I'm saying is I don't allow the economy out there to affect my economy in here. Yeah, no, I understand that. And I do the same thing. My concern is that we're, we're not talking conspiracy theories here. No, so not at all. You have a choice in, depending on what democracy you live in, to choose who lead you, who represent you, you can do it yourself. It's your choice. And this is the whole point that I'm making, that life is a choice. So you can either choose to deal with something or choose not to deal with something. But that's right. what you're saying, Randy, is you're observing the world from your own perspective. And this comes back to one of the, the previous lessons. The world we live in is not a result of people who don't know what they're doing. That's right. Uh, the format of the world, the rules and regulations of the world have been dictated by, and dictated, I mean, spoken by. A certain or, class. Okay, we'll call it a certain class. Okay, we'll call it a certain class. They have created this world, or okay. created parts of it. Okay, and I accept that. And would you say that we are in a position to change it? Absolutely. So I was reading an article about Three Buddhists that went to, I think it was Chicago, and they gathered a group of other Buddhists in the area. 
and they all kind of held hands around a certain bad area of Chicago. And they created a circle. I don't know if you ever heard the story, but they were there for three days, praying and chanting and singing. And the crime level went down drastically. I thought that was a phenomenal story. It touched my heart because it just goes to show you that if we join hands together, we can move mountains. Yeah. And again, coming back to theology, there was a, an instance where Jesus says to, to St. Thomas, you know, when your mind and your heart become one, the desire of your mind, the desire of your heart becomes one. Ask the mountain to move and it will move. And this is how we create, this is how we manifest things in our life. No, I, I don't think Steve Jobs woke up one day and said, oh, I think I'm going to build an iPhone today. He might have had the idea. But it was that constant cultivating where his brain and his, and his mind and his, his soul were connected. I see that. And with that, I do agree. All right, Randy, let's get back to marketing, your speciality. Given me this lesson, I'm going to condense it down to the last sentence because I like it. And I'd like you to explain it to us. So lesson number seven, it's just the same monkey in a different suit. That's right. It's just the same monkey in a different suit. And I hear this all the time. And I'm going to break this down into a couple of pieces. Back in the 80s, and I know I keep going back there, but back in the 80s, the, the universities were turning out graphic designers like they were going out of style. Tons of them. And back in the 80s, and Robert, I'm sure you remember this, the big ad agencies controlled oh, yeah. 90% of all of the major contracts in the world. And guys like you and I, we couldn't, have, A, we couldn't afford them. B, we could, there was no such thing as a little marketing company. Nope. Okay. There was just no such thing as that. We ended up doing all that kind of stuff ourselves. We made our own flyers. We, you know what I'm saying? And when, and when Vistaprint, we would turn around and have to send a letter to Vistaprint to get them to print. And they, it would take six weeks or six months for us to get our business cards back. So what happened was in, in this went on for a period of time because they were turning out graphic designers and the graphic designers were losing money. They couldn't get any work. Now, all of a sudden, the 90s roll around and they got the internet. And the internet gave these guys a whole new lease on life. Keep this in mind as we move forward, because now what happens is we are in a situation where graphic designers started doing websites. And I'm sure you remember those websites, right? They were brochures and they were informative, but they were really pretty pictures on the web. Yep. But what did they know about selling anything? Nothing. Hence now we move forward so many years. We now have Instagram. We now have social media. We have YouTube. We've got, back in the old days, we had TV, radio, which most of us couldn't afford. We had newspapers and we had magazines. And that was pretty much it. Today, we have a host of other things, which don't include those four anymore. That being said, clients come to me all the time and I'll say, they'll say to me, they'll say, tell me about your marketing. We do, we do Facebook or we've done Facebook. We have a website. We have, we do YouTube. We do flyers. We do, these are all venues. These are all mediums that we use. That's not marketing. If I were to, it's like saying I have a TV commercial. We do TV commercials. Okay. But that's just a medium that you use. That's not the marketing. So they'll say, we change our marketing. Instead of buy today, it's buy now. Okay, but that doesn't change anything. What I'm saying to you is that most people come to us and they'll turn around and they'll say, these are the things that we've been using, thinking that the medium is the end result. In an actual fact, it's the marketing that's done at the front. So what are we? We're just monkeys in a different suit. The same monkey is just, instead of doing TV and radio, he's doing social media and YouTube. The key with this is that marketing has to change. Marketing has to change. It has to change the way we present ourselves. It has to be authentic, especially with an evolved species like we are. Then people think, oh, the new millennials are entirely different in the way they think than the way old codgers like you and I think. I couldn't agree more. They're inspiring to me because they, they don't, think this new generation of leaders that are coming up for the most part, and I am generalizing here, don't think about stuff. They think about emotions. They think about what it means, how they, how that's fulfilling their values and their purpose. And I find that really good because hopefully 
we can get back to where we should be before all the monopolies, before all of the the greed took place, the Gordon Geckos for those in our oh yeah, you remember the Gordon Gecko? Yeah, I do. Took over. I I really do hope that they are thinking differently. But you're right. It's a very old, I don't know, I think it's a Shakespearean quote, a rose by any other name. It's, it doesn't matter what you call them. It is the same monkey in a different suit. We still Not all right. do the same thing. The, the, the bottom line to marketing, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Randy, but the bottom line to marketing is exactly what you said when we started. People buy on emotion. It's an emotional um, connection. And you see, and this is the part, and we, we, it takes so long to get bad habits, to breed bad habits out of, it takes generations to do that. I mean, I've got one of my clients and he turns around, and he says to me, he says, I heard a saying when I was a kid and I said, what's that? And he says, ABC, always be closing. Yeah. God, oh my God. You know what? You know, and you know what? I don't know, and no, it definitely doesn't work now, but I don't even know that it worked back then all that well. And it was all those little acronyms. And I'm sure you know just as many as I do, if not more. The, the point that I'm making to this is the fact that we're dealing with, this is a new species, okay? And I'm using the word species as, as maybe for a lack of a better word, but human beings connect with other human beings, okay? And you know what? When my father was a young boy, and when I, even when I was a young boy, my dad would turn around and say, we always came from a position of lack in our lives. Randy, money doesn't grow on trees and there's too much month at the end of the money. And I mean, we're broke all the time. The new human being doesn't look at things that way. They don't look on the premise of what I don't have. They look at, at the premise of what I do have. And this really comes down to a, a statement I made before. You, you can't have what you want. You can only have what you are. And it's, if you don't it's mind, rather but, deep, but yes, it is. And it, it is, but here's the interesting part of like attracts like, and you come to the, you know, you come to God and you're sitting at the throne of God and you say, you know what? I'm so poor. And God will say, yes, you're absolutely right. You are poor. Here's more poor. Here's more. Here's more. And as human beings, we look at this and we think well, that's not right. But in actual fact, that is right. because if like attracts like. And I come to the universe and I say, I'm poor. And that's what I'm giving out. Then that's what I'm getting back. How can you expect? Why are you so surprised when you get back what you asked for in the first place? That's a little deeper than I want to go. Um, okay. Gotcha. It, it, you know, I, I, I would love to have this conversation, but I think, I think we're getting into metaphysics. Here. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't else. want to go down that road. No. Remember when we were talking before, I said, I have this tendency of going down the rabbit hole. And that's why, look, that's why we have hosts on 10 lessons. Absolutely. Well, right, look, I, I, I do hear what you say, and I do agree. There's a lot of professions in the world today that are still the same as they were 15, 20, 50 years ago. Yeah. But they're dressed differently because there's new technology available to those professions. So I agree with you, and I do like the, that. So let's move to lesson number eight because... This one's also going to be uh, contentious. Lesson number eight. By the time a human being is 35 years old, they are functioning primarily on subconscious programming. Really, Randy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you, Absolutely. Give, us, can you give us some examples of that? So when a baby is born, for the first five years of their life, nature provides them with all of the understanding that they need. What doing for the first five years of their life is you're just mirroring what you're doing. True. There's no real conscious thought going into anything. By the time they're age five, their neocortex now is starting to form. And the neocortex brings them into consciousness. This is the reason why the Jesuit priests for years would say, give me a child until he is five and I'll show you the man. Because they would train him during the first five years to become sediment in the church. And it makes sense too, because how many programs do you need to be a member of a family, to be a brother or a sister? How many programs do you need to be a member of a family or a member of a village or a society or a community? I mean, thousands. But nature builds that in the first five years of their life. Now, this is not my findings. I, this is my studying that I've done through 
Dr. Joe Dispenza, very popular on YouTube. Bruce Lipton is another one as well. I'm not a scientist, but it's a theory that I follow, and I think it's a good theory. It's something that you actually have experienced and believe in. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's so many things in my life that are so rudimentary, so many things that are just habit for me. Okay. So many things that I just do automatically. I know. I understand you that. You can change any of it. Yes. You can change it at any time if you know how. Okay. And, and don't get me wrong. It's not that's a, a huge thing to do, but most people don't do it. Most people don't. And I agree with you there. Okay. So what I'm saying to you is that can you change your bad habits? Of yeah. course. Okay. Of course you can. You're an alcoholic. You don't have to be an alcoholic. You change your mind. Now, then the work starts once you change your mind. Now, on the other hand, too, the programs, and I'm not saying that they're all programmed by you or I'm not programmed by nature. What I'm saying to you is the environment, your family, your education, exactly. your government, yep. your TV, your radio, your phone, everything plays a part in programming your subconscious mind. And it's interesting because every you've ever done, every thought you've ever had is contained in that subconscious mind, easily recalled like that. And that gives you just an idea how quickly the human brain works. Again, I'm not a neurosurgeon, I'm not a neuroscientist, but it is a theory that I adapt to because I know how many idiosyncrasies or habits or things that I do just automatically. Yeah, me too. These are things that we don't know that we do. And that's the kind of programming that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about necessarily external, but external plays a part in that. Absolutely, it does. What is the lesson here then? What do you want people to take away from this? Become aware. Become aware of your thoughts. Become aware of the things that you do. Don't just do them for the sake of doing them. Become aware. And I believe that if you become aware, you start to recognize the things that you do that are great, you'll start to realize the things that you do that are not so great. See, and all of that being aware allows you to become a better human being. That is powerful. When you put it that way, you're echoing things that Ellen Langer, who is the godmother of mindfulness, talks about. Oh, absolutely. She's been on the show. She talked about that. So mindfulness, being mindful, being present all helps with that authenticity you were talking about oh, originally. Yeah. There's a lot there. And I think yeah. absolutely, Randy, it starts with being aware that you are subject to these lifelong programmatic episodes. Of course, everybody is. Everybody is. All right, let's go to lesson number nine because it's actually something I do all the time. And I think you just you've just explained it to me in this lesson. Lesson number nine: procrastination is a habit that is learned by repetition. Absolutely. So the more what you're saying basically is the more you procrastinate, the more you will procrastinate. Oh, without a doubt. And you know what? It's not just about work. It's no. not. It's about everything. It's like a guy who lies. Guy who lies turns around. First time he feels bad. Second time, it feels bad. Third time, I still feel bad, but I can go on. The fourth time, it's like, no problem. And your procrastination works the same way. The first time, you think, oh, geez, you know what? I should have really done this. The second time, it gets a little easier. Third time, it gets a little easier because you're developing a habit. And habits are supposed to make life easy. And so what you do is you continually build on that, Okay. Until eventually it just becomes so easy to procrastinate. And you know what? I think one of the things that for me, one of the, because I was a champion procrastinator, I was a champion at it and I knew I had to change it. So what I did was I got one of these. I'm sure you can see that. And I got one of these. And just for our listening audience, that's a pen and a pad. And I started writing down everything I do. Everything I needed to do, I had to write it down. Because if I didn't write it down, it wouldn't get done. And I found something that was really quite interesting, for me anyway, that when you take a pen and you put it to a piece of paper, something magic happens in your brain. All of a sudden, your brain starts thinking that this is important. And at least that was for me. 
So whenever I put anything on my pad, I get it done. Okay. And even if I can't get it done that day, I will make an attempt at it. You see, once you start creating that, once you start doing that, you start writing things down and then you take a stab at it. And then the next day you take another stab at it. And the third day you take another stab at it. At least, you know what? You're consistent. Okay. It may take you two weeks to get the thing written, but you know what? It's going to get done because that, every day it's on that list to do. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. But you are right. We've just rebroadcast a, an episode with Ori Ice and, and one of my favorite lessons that Ori has is the hardest thing to do is to do. Yeah. What great advice. That is. The brilliant. hardest thing to do is to do. Love it. You know? Me too, man. Uh, uh, but what you have said here is the reason that it's hard to do is because you just keep not doing it. So I, I, I love this because it's so true and I can see it in myself. So people, if you're procrastinating, then do what Randy says, write it down and try yeah. to go at it every day and break that procrastination habit. All right. Absolutely. Well, Randy, we've gotten to lesson number 10. So I think we've already touched on this. I'll let you take us out with this. Lesson number 10, the average human being has 80,000 thoughts a day. Most of them are the same and people wonder why their lives don't change. Yeah, absolutely. I read this in a book by Dr. Joe Dispenza and also by Dr. Bruce Lipton. Yeah, the book, I think, was Behavior Belief, something like that. I think it was. Anyways, the average human being has 80,000 thoughts a day. 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts they had yesterday. So when people come to you and they say, I just can't change my life because of the same thoughts you had yesterday. You want to change your life, change the way you think. And when you start to change the way you think, you start changing who you are. Mm. Look, Robert, do you remember your first job? Yes. What were you? What was I? The actual title of the job was a dressograph clerk. A dress of clock. Yes. Okay, but got it. Basically, I used to put account numbers on manual invoices. That's what okay. I did. Beautiful. Are you still that today? I can still do it today, but we. But are no, you, I'm not. You're not a clerk today? No. Okay. Because what happened was you left being a clerk to become something else. You become because you're a being. We're human beings. We're being human. The whole idea of being is to, and again, this comes back to what I said before. You can't have what you want. You can only have what you are. Mm. You are, when you're a clerk, you get all of the advantages and disadvantages of being a clerk. When you're a podcast host, a famous podcast host like you are. Famous. I, I don't know if I'll go with famous, but thank you. I, I said that for your benefit. When you become a podcast host, you get all the advantages and disadvantages of being a famous podcast host. You're not a clerk. You're a podcast host. You can only have what you are because you get the advantages and disadvantages of both. And that's kind of what I was trying to get at with this is that you, when somebody says, oh, you can have anything you want in this world, you can so long as you are that person. So when we say, oh, well, I want my life to change, change the way you think. You're a salesperson and you want to be a sales manager, act like one, think like one, feel like that person. And then you become that person. This is so true. And I don't not only speak from experience, I speak from witnessing others go through the same thing. So I, I absolutely back up what you're saying, Randy. You want change in your life? Think about how that change is going to impact you and think differently. So you can make way. those changes. Look, people, it's experience. Use the experience to give you the confidence to think differently. Yes, sir. And that's how it happens. Randy, this has been wonderful. They were very interesting lessons. Thank you for sharing them with us. Let me My ask pleasure. you, let me ask you this before we sign off. In all your years, what have you had to unlearn? Well, you and I were talking about this before. And I said to you, your old friend Bob Proctor. And he told me that the people of this new millennium of the wisest ones are going to be the ones who unlearn what they've already learned to relearn something new. So in answer to your question, I learning to be 
learning compassion, learning empathy, learning sympathy to feel others. For me, that's huge. So basically, you had to unlearn being selfish. Absolutely. And when I was 20 years old, not only did I know any, everything, but I was the greediest kid on the, on the block. Unlearning lessons, in my opinion, is the strongest way to learn. Oh, it's exactly what Bob said. It's exactly what Bob Proctor said. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Randy, where can we find you? Where can our listeners find you? What are you doing now? What you have books out? What's going on? I'm just in the process of finishing my first book. It's going to be called Sell to One or Market to Millions. It will be out on Amazon and cross my fingers. It'll be out on Audible as well. I'm working on a productivity course right now, which will be out before New Year. And people can find me on www.fearlessmarketer.com or they can email me at randy at fearlessmarketer.com or they can check me out on any of my social media channels. I'm on them all. Excellent. We're looking forward to that book. We hope that you will let us know so we can tell our whole audience when it, it is out. But I want to thank Love you it. today for your time, for your wisdom, for sharing this hour with us. Is there anything that you would like to leave with our with our audience before I sign off? Be authentic. Be the real you. Because that's good enough. Thank you. We'll finish here today. You've been listening to 10 Lessons Learned. Our guest today has been Randy Crane sharing his 10 Lessons Learned with us. This episode is supported, as always, by the Professional Development Forum. Please tell us what you think about today's lessons, what you think about our guest. Uh, If you disagree with Randy, if you agree with Randy, leave us a comment, send us an email. You can email us at podcast at 10lessonslearned.com. Go ahead and hit that like button, subscribe, and turn on that notification bell so you don't miss an episode of the only show that makes the world a little wiser lesson by lesson. And don't forget, you can only have what you are. See you on the next episode.